sorry, I'm just being nervous. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so we're officially called the Malaysian Youth Delegation, and we basically go to conference of parties every year. And we represent Malaysian Youth Climate Movement at International UN Climate Conference, or to be specific, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, as you guys are familiar with. So we are mentored and we hold various engagements and dialogues with um, people, the expert bodies in climate change, both locally and internationally. And our objectives include representing the climate movement in Malaysia, and of course to hold our leaders accountable for their actions. And we hope to pursue justice for those suffering the effects of climate change, and from there, we hope to act in solidarity with the frontline communities in Malaysia and across the globe. And most importantly, we're here to seek for solutions in climate change. So I'm um, going to tell you briefly about the strategies that we use in NYD. The first one would be advocacy. Um, we train our delegates to understand more about the advocacy aspects in UNFCCC. So we have our very own NYD training series last year. Um, so, as you know, NYD is um, batch by batch thing. So last year we had NYD 2015. So for that batch, uh, which is my batch, we had this NYD training series that covers actually quite a lot of parts of um, UNSC knowledge, from the policy to media um, to climate activists. Yeah. So you can find out more on our website on the training series. And from there, the training series we learn how to track policy development in the um, negotiations process. And besides this training, we engage in policies through lobbying and other associated efforts. So for last year, for example, um, we created a few papers and statements to, um, to voice our stand. So the picture on the top is uh, where we were part of the ASEAN youth paper drafting process. Um, we work with youth from other ASEAN countries to produce this um, youth paper on climate change. And after that, we ourselves, the Malaysian youth, we produce our own first ever Malaysian youth statement on climate change. And we have our British High Commission supporting this um, initiative. So um, one of our achievements for the statement is that we get acknowledged by the Prime Minister Office, by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment, and also the Ministry of Youth and Sport. So we actually had a chance to hand in the statement physically to our minister, as you see from this picture here. And next up, our strategy, second strategy, will be media. Um, before, during, and COP, and after COP itself, we constantly update um, um, on our online social media and also publish articles on our website. So this is one of the examples of our articles collection during COP21 last year on the website itself. We were also trained to produce um, press release of our own events. And of course, we hope to push our delegation stories to a larger media outlet. So we actively participate in interviews by international and local medias. This is one of our very recent interview with Yuren ASEAN, one of the um, regional media, radio. Yeah. And the next strategy that we use is mobilization. So uh, we're of course um, trained to conduct and plan actions in the UN space. Um, we were also um, trained to coordinate and leverage with other youths from other countries in UN itself, in COP itself, to um, conduct actions in COP plenary. So our example in COP21 last year was um, we were actively involved in this youth constituency under UNFCCC and um, we were part of the um, organizing committee of one of the biggest climate march called the D12. Um, so you can see the pictures here, we were there supporting the, this is one of the costs called zero by 2050, so basically supporting zero carbon emission by 2050. And the second picture, you can see Amalin there, um, it's one of our MYD member <laughs> at the corner. Um, he's quite active in this mobilization part in COP, he really enjoy it. So, um, yep, that's basically our involvement and our strategies. 
So you might be wondering what's next for us. Um, that's what I said, MYD is a um, year by year batch. So this year, MYD 2016, we're going to recruit soon. Um, so if you're interested to more, know more about us, you can just talk to any of our MYD members here later. So this is highlight, let me just introduce about this National Climate Change Survey bit. Um, as you recall, I talked about the Malaysian Youth Statement previously. So um, we also we conducted a survey to uh, compile results so that our statement is not just from our point of view, it's a collective uh, youth opinion. So this year we decided to expand it to a more um, holistic approach. Uh, we hope to conduct this climate change survey in every um, state, hopefully, if we have the capacity to do so. Yep. And of course, we're looking forward to send Malaysian U to COP22 this year at Marrakesh. So yeah, basically that's about us. Thank you. So, um, we have our, oh, it's gone, it's fine. Sorry, because I just took over this mission in the last minute. Um, so next up, we will have um, Hal Gracie from Sustainers to oh, sorry, um, have Gurmit from SG to give us speech. I think I'll speak to Good morning, friends. I've been asked to stand in by the current MCCT coordinator, Lavinia, at a couple of days ago. So I shouldn't be standing here. It should be she. Anyway, since I was involved in the formation of MCCT in 1992, which is the Malaysian Climate Change Group, maybe I'm in a better position to talk a little bit about the history of MCCT, what we have tried to do, and uh, where we are now. We basically were originally mobilized in when the formation of Climate Action Network Southeast Asia was done in uh, Jakarta, not Jakarta, also Jakarta and Java, earlier, six months earlier. Then there was a need among a few of us who were there, we said we should form our own group here itself. And there were only basically, at that time, EPSM and the center. And we had a slightly different name, Malaysian Climate Core Group, then we changed to Malaysian Climate Change Group. Basically, our interest was to work on climate change issues both within the country and internationally. We have found that over the well, six, 14 years now, it is not that easy, and especially going overseas. Going overseas has been very much dependent upon whether money is available. Earlier, earlier years, because Kensi was relatively well funded, they could provide us some funding, and also Ken itself had money. But over the last few years, that has totally disappeared, sort of thing. So now, we are basically dependent upon, we try to raise money within the country, we have not been successful as the youth, maybe our approach is too outdated. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, to cut the story long, we haven't really been officially going to any COP for the last almost three COPs. GEC was representing us in a way, because GEC on its own goes to the COPs, so we there in Paris, but Lavinia didn't go, neither did anybody else from the other NGOs go. Now, one of the problems we have working within the country itself, there are very few pressure points available in this country where you can really lobby. Uh, there is the National Climate Change Committee on which MCCG and SETGAM sit, but that committee meets once, twice a year, but depending on the Secretary General of the uh, Ministry. And last year, the committee never met at all, and I'm still pestering the new Secretary General when we will meet. One of the roles of the committee, which was to me useful, was to look at the positions of the delegate, delegation at the coming COP. But that has been sort of cut down. At one stage, we had full length discussions almost half a day, and we managed to provide some inputs and changes. But subsequently, I remember one of the secretary general, Sandman, who is now a fugitive somewhere, I won't leave me to know who he is. Uh, he just cut down the discussion to one hour. And we said, how the heck can we discuss the national position within one hour? And all the people just presented us, oh, this is what the national delegation is going to do. You hardly could comment on it. So in a way, it's become a shura. But I think the other things that we have tried to do is more in 
the capacity of individual NGOs and stuff, rather than MCCG, when we sit on the various committees, then the government invites us to. But you know, most of you who are familiar with Malaysia, Malaysian government actually makes a charade of public participation and similarly NGO participation. Sometimes you find at the end of it, is it worth going? You spend so much time and effort, then they say, listen, they don't take it on board. And that brings us on the uh, national physical plan to things like uh, master plans and all that. So much so that I've come to a stage where I'm not very, very cynical, but I should go for this meeting. Uh, but then you go against go because you have very little other options left. So in a way, I would argue that we need maybe you perhaps to give us some new ideas on how to be more, because even giving this quotation, how much of it actually made it made we had an impact on the delegation? Did they ever articulate anything? So I think what we need to do perhaps, and this is I think the witness in Malaysia is we need to monitor and call them to account, hey we can do this, but you did nothing about it. Why didn't you do anything? Perhaps we need to do more of that. But of course, with the current intolerance of information, the closing down of the website, TMI now, and then threats, OSA is strengthened. I don't know whether we will have the democratic space. But all our years, we have tried to push the democratic space, and we'll keep on pushing. But we hope the youth will push more strongly, and maybe use your uh, new internet skills and all that to spread the message more widely. Because at the moment, it's really, really tough. Luckily, you have the internet now. 20 years ago, 15 years ago, we were totally at the mercy of the media, mass media. And it was coverage was on and off. When the media felt like giving you coverage, you receive a little bit, otherwise nothing. So, with those remarks, I think I will uh, end by saying that uh, just doing a plug-in for Center, we are having a climate change, an annual climate change dialogue. This year it will be held on the 26th of May. In the Armada Hotel, we hope to bring down the British High Commissioner, the American Ambassador, and the Malaysian Minister to come down and say what really Paris is going to be. Consequences. Thank you. Thank you for the information. Next up, we will have Carl Gracie um, from Sustainers, the US Youth for Justice and Sustainability um, Board Director, to give us a his opinion on COP21 climate change. Thanks. Yeah. Everybody, uh, thank you, first of all, for, for inviting me and letting me be here. And more importantly, thank you all for being here and being engaged in this. The fact that there are so many people in this room right now is a very good sign, both for Malaysia and for the rest of the world in the coming years. Um, I, I know we're a little behind schedule, so I will try to catch us up. Um, I just want to tell basically a, a story. And, and it's a story that has three parts. The first part of the story is what happened. And I think you've heard some of this already and you know, so we had we had Paris and, and it happened. Uh, and, and we had and governments around the world came together and, and made what is arguably the strongest commitment so far to fighting climate change. That's one piece of the story. Another piece of the story is that this same level of effort to stop climate change has been growing all around the world. So in the US, we've seen both uh, a, a, our government taking a much stronger commitment to climate change than, than any president we've had before. We've seen now in, now in our country, in more than half of, half of our states, it's just it's the same price to buy your electricity from renewable energy as it is from fossil fuels. And just a few years ago, that was unheard of. We, we never would have thought that, that you could do that. And in a couple of years, it's expected to be 80% of our country. It's just as easy to get uh, renewable energy as it is from fossil fuels. That's tremendous. We're hearing Chinese state leaders saying that they don't see the, a future for electricity growth in China coming from fossil fuels, from coal, but rather from renewables. We're, we're seeing governments in the Middle East saying that even oil and petroleum can't be the only future for their countries. Those are things that we, we didn't hear just a few years ago. And the other big thing that we're seeing, which is part two of this story, is not just what happened, but who did it. And that's us. What we're also seeing is that people are getting up, they're getting active, and they're saying that the way we've done things can't be anymore. 
that, that the future, that the threat we face from climate change is too big, it's too important just to leave to governments to do, that it's actually going to be up to us to make the difference. And I think you've seen already, and you just heard, some of the growth of this movement in Malaysia. We're seeing this around the world. Um, a few years ago, I don't know where Adrian went to, but Adrian and I and a bunch of other young people uh, got together and created that youth uh, constituency at the climate change negotiations because we saw that that was a place where young people needed a voice where, where we weren't represented and where we had something important to say, both to our own governments and to everyone else around the world. So it's not just that governments agreed to something in Paris, it's that we made them agree to that. That we stood up and we made them take stronger action. And we're seeing people around the world do the same thing. The third part of this story is what needs to happen next. So Paris happened, but Paris won't be enough. Not even close. The, the dangers and the deaths that we face from climate change will continue to happen if we don't do <coughs> not enough to say, okay, great, Paris, we're done. We need to do so much more. Um, it's not going to, the, the agreement that was reached there will, will not be even close to what is needed to stop serious climate change from happening around the world. As exciting as, as the growth of renewable energy is, uh, we still need a lot more of both young scientists as well as young activists to go out there and create the new technologies and to create the momentum and the passion in civil society to make those things happen, to change what governments are doing, and, and to forge our own path. So we have to be part of writing that story and growing our own movement even beyond what we already have today. Because if we don't, it, it, we're not going to get to the kind of change that we truly so this moment right here, you being in this room, this is exactly what we need, and we actually need even more of it. So the next time there's a meeting like this, hopefully you and three of your friends are here uh, to make this movement even stronger. I mean, the Malaysian Youth Climate, the power shift in Malaysia has been tremendous. The Malaysian Youth Delegation, I mean, you've really brought the voice of Malaysian youth to the world, and I, I've just been so impressed and so excited that every time that I've seen your delegation um, at the COPS, because, because you're really doing something Incredible. But we need more. We need more from, from me, from, from young people in the US. We need more from you. We have to talk about uh, what we can do to take this to the next level because there's so much more to do. We, you've heard the kinds of challenges that you face and the threats that you face here. People in civil society are facing those threats and those challenges from the fossil fuel industry, from governments that don't want to take enough action. Um, this will be hard. I don't want to make it sound like, like it's going to be a simple effort. It's, it's going to be a tough road over the next couple of years. Paris wasn't the end of something, it was actually the beginning. And so what we need to figure out now is what we do next to take things to the next level, to take these successes that we have achieved and double them, triple them, ten, tenfold over, because that's when we're going to get to the place where we really see a different world that looks more like us, that represents us, where the most vulnerable people around the world are not suffering the way that they are today and the way that, that they're on track to suffer if we don't take stronger action on climate change. So thank you for everything you've already done. Thanks for being here. I'm really excited to hear about what comes next, both for Malaysia and for the rest of the world. Thank you. do not use the mic, don't have the loud voice compared to those speakers here. Um. Okay, so um, how do you find this two speakers information right just now? Do you have anything to share before we proceed? Malaysians, as usual, so shy. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you guys can start to prepare your Q&A session for the panel in a while. Right. right. So, um, have you guys actually go through the panelist profile for today? Yes, yes, yes. I see nodding hands. <laughs> okay. So, I'll briefly just go through their profiles. So we have three speakers today with a mod um, and one moderator. 
Um, we have Dr. Gary Williams Sarah from the Ministry of Natural Resource and Environment. And we have Ms. Chi Yok Ling from Third World Network. And also our own MYD member, Representative Elaine C. And our moderator is a radio um, DJ from Duran ASEAN. So Dr. Gary is the Deputy Under Secretary of Environment Management and Climate Change Division of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment. He is responsible for policy analysis, development and support for environment management and climate change and sustainable development. He will be bringing the perspective of government to this session. And Ms. Yot Link, she is an international lawyer whose area of expertise include the environment, social and economic impacts of globalization, um, especially in the countries of the um, global south. So since 1993, she has worked closely with key negotiators from the Global South, scientists and NGOs to campaign for biosafety and climate justice. She was a member of the Malaysian Task Force that worked for two national laws related to biosafety and the regulation of access to genetic resources. She will be providing us the CSO Civil Society Organization's outlook on this session. Um, Um, I'll go on with the speaker profile. So, <laughs> yeah, we're actually waiting for our moderator, so <laughs> just a few little bit of time. And um, Elaine C, um, I think she's not here. But is see her in a while. <laughs> for information, she's the youngest member among us, the Malaysian New Delegation. She's just 19 this year. Um, she was one of those being chosen to attend COP21 in Paris last year. So currently, she's a pre-university student. Um, she has shown extraordinary passion, so she is late. <laughs> She's really passionate in making contribution in national climate movement since 18. And at 19, she actively participated in intensive climate trainings and forums, as well as taking up a challenge, such as chairing the promulgation ceremony for our Malaysian News Statement last year. And she speaks on behalf of the Environmental NGO in COP21 last year in one of the plenaries. So this effort successfully equipped her to be one of the uprising climate youth leader. Um, so during her time in COP21, she had been tracking the Malaysian delegation by following the negotiations and mainly focusing on climate finance. Um, so um, I will go through the moderator's profile. Sorry, I'm just boring you guys off. Should I stop? <laughs> <laughs> So we have all of them here now. Great. Um, okay. Oh, okay. Shout out to our hashtags. <laughs> so if you have any pictures taken during this session, selfies with the speakers or whoever, you can just um, post on. <laughs> yeah, post on our uh, post on to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter with this hashtags. Feel free to play with it. NYD, Paoji, MCA, not Malaysia. Um, Adrian is very particular with this. So remember it's MCA. <laughs> and um, hashtag Paris Agreement, hashtag what um, means for me. Actually, UNSC is now um, um, asking what does Paris Agreement mean for everyone because it will be signed on April 22nd. So play along with the hashtags. <laughs> so can I invite Dr. Gary onto the stage? Um, she has interviewed quite a few 
important people. <laughs> yeah, so, um, okay, she, she just being humble, that's fine. Okay. I'll pass the floor to Arlene. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm sure everyone is uh, you know, all up here to talk about climate change and also the COP21 agreement. So first of all, I just want to say thank you to the organizer and thank you for everyone coming here to discuss about this very important and critical uh, topic. And uh, without further ado, uh, just to give a bit of uh, summary about our discussion today. Of course, everyone knows about what is COP21. It's a, it's a Paris Agreement. And it's an agreement that is legally binding, aims to tackle climate change. And we have a bunch of uh, Malaysians who have been there and they want to share their views and what are the issues that we'll discuss there. So without further ado, so I want to introduce our first speaker, but just a bit of a summary how it's going to work. Uh, the panelists will be given 15 minutes. It's a Q&A format. They will be answering uh, questions <coughs> thrown by me. But later on, uh, we will open to the floor. Everyone can answer, uh, ask the panelists any questions that they have in mind. Uh, so the first panelist will be Dr. Gary William Tessera. Hi. And just a bit of his background, he's the Deputy Under Secretary of Environment <laughs> Management and Climate Change Division Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment. That's a long one. <laughs> I'm sure it's <laughs> Anyway, um, he's responsible for policy and analysis, development and support for environment management and um, climate change and sustainable development. So he's at the core of the Malaysian delegate. Uh, my first question to you, go to your question. So I don't know who is Prof Gudia, maybe you can give a bit of a background. Uh, he had lobbied for the uh, civil society to organization to pass, participate in the first week. And why Malaysia is very vocal on civil society's participation, perhaps you can give a bit of an insight. Oh, this is only one mic. <laughs> Sorry. Right, thank you very much, Ali. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the organizers. Um, uh, yeah, perhaps may maybe I need to tell you just a little bit about, about the Malaysian delegation and uh, our role in the, the COP. Uh, Malaysia represents uh, much more than Malaysia itself. I'm not, I'm not sure if you've heard that you've been to any of these forums before, but you uh, have heard the name Professor Gudia. Professor Gudia is, of course, uh, a law professor at uh, SEP Law, uh, University of Malaya. Uh, and uh, has been uh, one of the key negotiators uh, for things like the uh, uh, CB, CBDR. I don't know. <laughs> it's a CBD. It's the UN, UN CBD, uh, uh, Nagoya, uh, yeah, biosafety, a number of, of, of uh, uh, extremely important uh, uh, protocols and agreements. Uh, it's ex extremely uh, skilled uh, and uh, uh, articulate. Uh, spokesperson, and for that reason, uh, he was spoke he was selected as a spokesperson for the like-minded developing countries, which is a group of uh, about 30 countries uh, in the world that uh, Malaysia is, is proud to be part of. And so, uh, <clears throat> in formulating our collective position as like-minded developing countries, uh, these countries selected Professor Gudiel to, to speak on their behalf. This gives him and Malaysia and the like-minded developing countries a lot of exposure. And uh, as you know, in negotiations, when you stand out, you set yourself up as a target as well. Um, for my part, uh, apart from being the, the, the lead negotiator for Malaysia, I'm also the coordinator of the Group of 77 in China. And this is, uh, I function as the overall coordinator, and I try and, and find areas uh, where the G77 in China, which, as you know, is, is a very large number of countries, uh, over 100 countries, can actually have common positions. And it's one thing to have a common position, it's one thing to agree on something, but it's very difficult, difficult to put that into writing because then every single word matters and it's extremely difficult. So I do have uh, a number of, of coordinators that handle the specific themes. And these are, are from a number of different countries. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, where G77 and China uh, is most in agreement is on the issue of 
the climate debt and the need for climate finance, for adaptation and for mitigation, and the uh, the home uh, that that climate finance has is very clearly spelled out in uh, the articles of the convention, Article four point three <laughs> specifically. But uh, uh, we also have coordinators for adaptation, for loss of damage, uh, for technology, for capacity building, and these coordinators deal with, with specific thematic issues. But going back to the question, uh, Malaysia and the like-minded group of developed countries and the G77 were of the same mind uh, regarding the presence of observers in the negotiation. And this is because, as has Carl has pointed out quite, quite accurately, the negotiators and the governments do not function in a vacuum. There are numerous lobbyists constantly harassing all negotiators from all countries. Sometimes it's government to government, sometimes it's business to government, sometimes it's NGO to government. But the position that governments ultimately take is a function of all of these plus what the governments themselves, as they get together, perceive as being a workable solution. Yes, we could take extreme positions, but that would mean that after two weeks, two and a half weeks for some of us, sometimes three weeks, we have nothing, we do not have an agreement. Right? And so it is, a, it is a process of give and take, and sometimes the presence of observers in the room does make a difference, because then there, there is a physical presence of uh, entities in the room that have and that are known to have specific views and that are capable of carrying what they hear in those rooms out. So if a government uh, takes a position where they are blocking a position that is obviously something that many, many countries, particularly vulnerable countries and developing countries have interest in, then that is something that the world has to see. Many times, in the formal meetings, in the closed groups, governments feel much more comfortable taking hardline stances and blocking issues that they should block, all right? And don't, uh, uh, don't be mistaken about this, it was the G77 and China, the group of developing countries that were pushing for the presence of non-government entities in these meetings to ensure that there would be no buying off, bullying, uh, or any other kind of high pressure negotiation, uh, for which some countries are, are known. Okay. Uh, I hope that... that uh... yeah, it seems like what you mean, after all, is all about balancing the power inside the room. Um, on, on the second note, um, when, you, when you talk about uh, you know, trying to get everyone on board, usually we will have you know, the bigger powers, such as the US, to push other smaller countries into agreeing uh, with this COP21. I, I want to go to the next question because um, climate change has, has never been such uh, a, a top priority for Southeast Asian countries, not even for Malaysia. So how the US lobby Prime Minister Najib Raza into agreeing the agreement? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's <laughs> so I, I, um... I'm not sure that, that that's the question. Yeah, I, I perhaps need to address the question in the first place. Um, Everyone lobbies everyone. This, this is a negotiation. And so we have lobbyists everywhere. And as I said just moments ago, they, they, come, from, they come from business, they come from, uh, they come from entertainment sometimes, you know? So it's, it's, uh, it's, it is a very mixed bag. And uh, uh, I, I would uh, not be telling you the truth if I didn't tell you that, that uh, the EU lobbies extremely hard. Individual countries within the EU lobby, the UK lobby is extremely, extremely hard. And, and they, they come to you with, uh, with very, very strong points and very rational arguments. It's sometimes very difficult to, to uh, provide a counter argument, especially when you're speaking as a group. But uh, uh, as, and I, think, and I think you used the word correctly, it's a balance of powers. And that, this is why coalitions exist within the negotiations, the U.S. doesn't operate alone. The U.S. operates as, as part of the umbrella group, which is uh, the U.S., Russia, Japan, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, uh, one more somewhere. 
Yeah, no <laughs> All right, and so, and so as a group, uh, where they can, they take positions and they push very hard. And, and it's difficult to, to push back against such a group. Uh, of course, the EU is, is its own very strong group of 28 uh, countries. Um, and, then, and then there are other groups. Uh, there, there are groups uh, like the Environmental Integrity Group, which is uh, Switzerland, Mexico, Liechtenstein, Monaco, South Korea. And, uh, and, and sometimes those groups, which are a mixture of developed and developing countries, try to bring some semblance of balance in. But it, it can be very polarized. And, and, um, you know, it, so within, within the G, uh, G77 in China, you've got the uh, Association of Latin American States, Independent uh, Latin American countries, ILAC, uh, the Arab group, Africa group. Asia doesn't have a group because the Asian group includes South Korea and Japan, and they're not in G77 in China. So it's difficult for the Asian group to, to have a voice, which is why then we have had like minded developing countries. So, no, um, it would, it would uh, not be true to say that any particular president or prime minister or king lobbies any other. It, phone calls happen. They happen all the time. They happen at 3 a.m. Okay, uh, our minister met with the, the minister of China. He met with the, the minister of Saudi Arabia, and yes, he met with John Kerry. Uh, and uh, 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 these were face-to-face uh, -face talks. They were very frank talks, and they were very difficult talks. And there was a lot of persuasion going on. But ultimately, I think what what happened was we were able to convince each other that somewhere in between our positions was a position that we were willing to use as the framework to move ahead. I, I want to add on to that question. What was the deal maker? What made Najib the all all governments all government the uh, where is it in for the region? Uh, it's to, to be to be to be very frank uh, it's it's not any one thing that you can put your, your finger on. As a matter of fact, it's many things that are yet to be decided. Okay, the 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 uh, addressing the climate does not happen at the Paris Agreement alone. Uh, I was going to to expand a little bit and, and say that that uh, the international realm is should account for less than half of what we do to address climate change. In fact, it's a very small bit. It's that bitch with, 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 with which we agree between countries what we're actually going to do domestically. And that's the, that's the elephant, that's the 99%. Okay, going and attending these things is just a little bit where we talk about what we've done so far, what we think we're capable of doing, what we think we could do if we had more resources, more technology, more capacity, and how we're going to try to move ourselves from a downward spiral into an ambition cycle so that we can actually begin to, to um, pit uh, economic forces against economic forces. There are economic forces pushing for the status quo. How do we pit new technologies, clean technologies, green technologies, sustainable technologies, sustainable business against business as usual business so that the whole world can move together? so that we can get from a developing country status to developed country status without ever going through a phase of high, high carbon emissions. Okay, so that, that's the point. So um, the, the, the deal maker, as it were, is what, what do we see as, as putting us in this ambition loop where uh, uh, you know, some are fond of saying, oh, now we're in a situation of action by all rather than actions by some. Many developing countries don't see it that way. Many developing countries said even before the, the, uh, uh, the Paris Agreement, developing countries were already doing more than developed countries, with less resources, with older technologies, with less skilled people. All right, there was, a, there was a greater urgency among developing countries because they disproportionately bear the brunt of extreme weather events. I've got uh, relatives in Fiji right now, and their electricity is still on and off. And for, for a while, there were four days without electricity and running water. So, uh, you know, I just, I landed at 4.15 this morning, so excuse me if I'm a bit hazy on this. Okay, but yesterday I was meeting with Trick Talley, the U.S. lead negotiator. 
I was meeting with Laurent, uh, Laurent uh, uh, Tibiana, the, the French uh, 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 climate ambassador, was, was the ambassador and uh, uh, did a lot of work with, with uh, uh, Laurent Flamieux, who was the president of the COP. And the things we're talking about are things like, well, now, we, now that we've got to begin acting on the Paris Agreement and, and putting in place the bodies, organizations, the forums, the, the subsidiary bodies that we need, all right? How do we rebuild Fiji in such a way that it's going to be resilient? That the next storm doesn't, doesn't simply come in and take out all the, 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 the solar panels that you don't put in. The solar panels are terribly aerodynamic. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay? So, you, I mean, it, it's, if, if, if it's difficult, if, 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 if a storm can blow away a diesel jet set, what will it do to solar panels that are not employed in a manner that is adapted to changing climate conditions? Uh, just the next question uh, is about Nicaragua. So why was it? Uh, why was the country ignored during the closing plenary of Committee de Paris, and why they didn't receive uh, more support of? And what are the implications of supporting against? Uh, the Paris Agreement. Uh, uh, the, the last, the last one is, is uh, uh, I think, I think quite rhetorical. Okay, uh, if we didn't get the Paris Agreement, where would we be now? Um, first, I think that I think that we've done a great disservice to the multilateral process. Okay, we've already had one big bust in Copenhagen. And uh, uh, the COPs in between have been essentially a process of rebuilding trust and confidence, both in the process as well as among ourselves as negotiators. Uh, and the meeting that I came uh, from yesterday uh, is a meeting, it's, 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 it's uh, billed as the first meeting following the COP. And it's a meeting of about uh, 30 major parties where they actually take stock of what was achieved and what was not. But uh, I cannot even begin to think about the situation now if we did not have a Paris Agreement. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a clue. But what I, what I would know is that we would be in a much worse position uh, if we were to begin thinking of, of how, as a global community, we would continue to address climate change through the multilateral process. Multilateral process is not an easy process. It's not a quick process. It is fraught with all kinds of bureaucracies. Okay, but the idea that we use, uh, uh, well, I guess consensus. That the idea that is consensus based means that you take a longer time to achieve that consensus. You might achieve a weaker consensus, but everyone is at the very least going to pull in the same direction. And it's, much, it's a much better uh, environment than one where you know you get a quick vote, you get a strong agreement, but, uh, you know, a decision, but then not everyone's going to pull when implementing that decision. Or they're going to pull in the opposite direction because they voted against it. You can't expect anything else. Right? So I think, I think that all these issues are, are, are important. I mean, apologize for taking so long. Oh, Nicaragua. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, Nicaragua, Nicaragua raised an issue at, at, the, at the very last minute uh, that uh, uh, essentially called for, uh, at least in my personal opinion, uh, far too much change in the documents that were being negotiated. Um, much of, 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 of what is decided actually uh, dwells on familiarity. The, the more often you see a piece of text, the, 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 the more easy it is to understand, uh, to assess the implications for your country, for your coalition, the more likelihood it, it has of surviving. Uh, I think Nicaragua wanted to raise something that, that while it was relevant, uh, was something that was raised far too late to, first of all, allow them to explain what they were, were trying to push for, 
And second, too late, uh, more importantly, too late for other countries to assess what the implications would be if it were to be put down. Like I said, things can happen very, very quickly on the surface in a conversation. But the moment you put something down on paper, immediately flags go up all over the world. Okay? There was a point uh, I, 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 uh, I recall um, at one of the, the intersessionals where I was just dealing with the ten, 10 ASEAN member states. 10 ASEAN member states. And I just had a piece of text that called for sustainable development. And I couldn't get ASEAN to agree on sustainable development, if you can believe that. Okay, at least now, you know, ASEAN is, is much, once you get familiar with that and you understand what the scope of, of sustainable development is, then you can begin accepting that term as part of something from the So I think that, that unfortunately, while uh, uh, the concerns of, of uh, Nicaragua were, were valid, and, and let me point out, Nicaragua is not the first and it will not be the last uh, country to be steamrolled uh, in, in this way. All right. Uh, in fact, at the very same COP, South Africa, who is the chair of G77 in China, said they were willing to adopt the text as it originally was before the typo was changed. Right? And they were ignored. Uh, we should ask more, but uh, we have to move on to the next speaker. I will leave it to the floor. Yes? Uh, excuse me. Yeah. You may ask, if I may ask, can you please summarize for me what are the four main points of Agreement. Uh, we can uh, maybe we can, I can open it to the board later on for the question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, I want to move on to the next uh, speaker. Uh, the lady uh, is in your plane. Yeah. So the lady here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Not the youngest. So her name is Miss uh, Chi Yokling. Just a bit of a background. Uh, she is an international lawyer who her areas of expertise include environment, social, and economic impacts of globalization, especially in countries of the South. And since 1993, she has worked closely with key negotiators from the global South, scientists, and NGO to come to campaign for biosafety and climate justice. Uh, she's also, or she was also a member of Malaysian task force that worked on two national laws related to biosafety and the regulation of access to genetic resources. So my question to you, Ms. Yokling, uh, representing the non-governmental or the civil society, uh, there's this thing called 1.5 degree. Uh, it was talked about a lot in the first week of the COP21. So what um, AOCs give, or AOSIS GAVE, uh, up to get uh, 1.5 degree mention in the text? Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you, of course, to MIT for, for doing this. I think it's a very, very good idea. Um, I think that, well, first of all, generally, you know, the Paris Agreement is not a completely new agreement. I think there's been a lot of uh, misunderstanding that we have no climate agreement, no legally binding commitments for climate action until the Paris Agreement. Uh, I think that's very wrong. Uh, actually, we have the mother convention, the, the legally binding treaty of 1992, but many of you are familiar with that. And I think the training that you all have been doing is so important to sort of put in context that we have a very actually ambitious and equitable and fair legally binding treaty since 1992, okay? Because back then, the awareness of climate impact and climate change was very, very high. It was very high on the political agenda of all countries. Many of you were not born yet at that time. Uh, that's why you think that nothing existed, you know? Uh, but it was that. The problem is, in the last 25 years, the implementation of that agreement has been a disaster, okay? Because that agreement recognized historical responsibility of what today is the OECD world, the developed countries. That they have taken up most of the carbon space, the atmospheric space, and therefore they have to do more. Because in the process of polluting and eating up the, uh, the atmosphere, they become very rich and very developed. So they have capacity and resources and technological potential. That is the situation that we had 25 years ago. So it wasn't that developing countries had no obligation to do anything. Our obligation was to not follow the same pathway, but to go sustainable. We also failed, all right? Now, of course, a lot of it has to do with the failure in the developed countries of doing the fundamental shift, the power shift. Not just power shift, but energy, urbanization, agriculture, 
I think too much attention is put on just energy. It's not just about energy and technology, it's about our entire way of life, our consumption, how we do it and deal with forests and land and, and agriculture. So, so they didn't do that fundamental shift. They also failed to provide the means of implementation, the financial resources, the clean technology, to the developing countries. Developing countries follow the same pathway. I don't say that we didn't do anything. We did, but not enough. So we basically follow the same pathway. So 25 years forward, we are in a situation where the agreement uh, has not been implemented fully, right? Now, of course, for many countries feeling the impact of climate change, they have no choice. When a hurricane hits you, when extreme weather hits you like drought or what have you, the countries, mostly developing countries, they have to spend money divert from other you know, uh, spending because they have no choice. And we know uh, climate hazards can actually wipe out a lot of the good things that happen in the country. So what actually uh, really at stake in the road so-called to Paris was because back in Copenhagen in 2009, a bunch of developed countries, basically led by uh, you know, the, uh, the US and Japan and Canada and Australia, they just felt that, well, you know, we don't like it because we can't do all that. We don't like the equitable framework. So we want to change the rules. So the fight has been to change the rules. And in the name of saying that the world has changed, today China is the biggest polluter. So why should China do less than America? Well, I've lived in China for 10 years. I'm not defending China's uh, pollution because that's why I'm home for the six months. I can't live in China. But it's 1.4 billion people. Or 1.3, not 1.4 yet. And they have huge poverty still. So this tension between growth, uh, uh, and the right kind of growth and pollution, and what kind of fuel to use, is not easy. So for me, I think it's important for us to realize the Climate Change Convention was never just about environment. It's about what kind of development vision we want to have, what kind of technology we want to choose to have. And this is a very challenging development challenge, right? So if you look from the science point of view, the science agrees that two degrees, even keeping at two degrees uh, rise from pre-industrial level is not enough. Right? But that, at least that is what politically has been agreed by all countries. So we all agree that two degrees is the minimum. We should go even below that. It's been for a few years there. But the, not only the small islands, the AOCs, the alliance, the small islands, it's not only them, but the least developed countries, the Africa group, Africa group, a group of very sort of uh, radical, progressive groups of uh, countries in uh, South America, the Alba country, Venezuela, Ecuador, uh, Nicaragua, you know, about 10, 12 countries. So it was a very large group of countries which wanted to put 1.5, uh, you know, a degree uh, sort of temperature rise into the agreement, all right? But not just to put 1.5, because 1.5 means we have to do massive, massive actions, right? We have to change entirely the planet's way of developing and being. How are we going to do that? I'm not talking about technology and solutions. How to share in a fair and equitable way the responsibility of those actions. And that's why one of the biggest fights was to keep the principle of the UN FCCC, common but differentiated responsibilities. That we all have to act, but we all have to do different levels. And you can do as much as you can, but some have to take the lead to do more. This was what was trying to be dismantled by a whole bunch of developed countries. All right? And so the Paris Agreement was about reaffirming equity as a framework, reaffirming ambition because the science tells us we must do so. All right? Now, a lot of the publicity talking about the United States championing the coalition of ambition. But in the closed door rules, you will hear things like, I mean, we couldn't get into the rules. I mean, Malaysia and all the developing countries did not manage to persuade five or six other developed countries to let us back into the rules of the, of the actual negotiations. But we were talking to many different negotiators. All right? The United States said, we understand why 1.5 is important. President Obama met with a few heads of states from the small islands. And they all went there the first week. We understand why you're concerned. I also, I'm paraphrasing, I wasn't in the room, but this is... More or less what happened. I, Obama, believe in climate change. And you're right, this president is trying to do more in the last one year before he leaves office, right? But the small analysts were told, we understand your concern, others were told, we understand your concern, but we cannot take anything back to Washington that is legally binding on mitigation, that is legally binding on financial commitment for the world, all right? That's why in the Paris Agreement, for mitigation of developed countries, the world is not shall take action across the whole economy, but should. That was the typo that Nicaragua was saying in the last minute, you cannot allow that typo to go through. Malaysia and many countries fought, but the French presidency in the last six hours said, if we don't give in to the United States to change shall to should to mitigation, then we will not have a Paris Agreement. 
So one of the biggest setbacks for me, for the Paris Agreement, is that in the UNFCCC, the obligation is legally binding. All developed countries must and shall take mitigation action across the entire economy. All right? Today is should. And developing countries are now, in return for getting all these developed countries on board, developing countries, and I think at the national level is good, we should now take mitigation actions, we also have to, in Malaysia for example, and in, over time, we should also take across the whole economy. It's a huge, huge commitment. I mean, it's really not, I mean, if you're going to do it, it's very serious work, okay? So 1.5 in the end, what we see in the treaty is what? Pursue efforts to limit, pursue efforts to limit 1.5. So you see the number 1.5 is quite weak, but it's okay, 1.5 is there. The issue is how to share the responsibility. Now, I think the biggest success we have for the Paris Agreement is we kept the common but differentiated responsibility and equity principle. It's more in the treaty, you operationalize it. So the work is now in the next years, how to really work towards 1.5. But you can only do it if there's equity internationally. You cannot expect Fiji and Samoa and even Malaysia to carry the burden. All right? But how do we do it fairly? So the fight will continue as to how to do it fairly. But meanwhile, I'm very worried because President Obama's uh, presidential regulation to reduce emissions from power plants has been halted by the Supreme Court because 26, 27 state governments have said this is not your business, it's against the Constitution. So, so the fight is in every country. Uh, I want to continue asking you, but I want to just uh, raise a bit of... Uh, uh, for those who drive, uh, who drive here and park at B1, uh, these cars are about to get clamped, so you <laughs> <laughs> so if, the, if these are your cars, uh, please go down and get it. It's B2. Yeah, B1. Uh, it's QAW3879. Uh, I think this is IOB or 10B. IOB 4067P BMV3521 WMW89. 41WYX9662 WTF7018. So, that's all. Anyway, <laughs> anyway uh, move on to the next question. Um, I, I have two questions uh, in this particular one question. Um, first of all, it's quite interesting when you uh, were describing the whole uh, process, the negotiation process, and how, you know. Uh, the developing countries do not really have that much uh, way or that much say within the whole um, discussion. Um, when it comes to Malaysia, right? Uh, what is, what are our compromises in order for us to you know move forward to agree with the climate change deals? And for uh, the rest of the country, like what else that they did during the negotiation process in order for their voices to get heard? I, I would say that, you know, it's the reverse is true. I, I think that developing countries and Malaysia play a very key role at the negotiation level. Over the last four or five years, I've actually uh, gotten this act together. I, I think we realized that, as we were discovering early on, you know, the, the imbalance in power, as you put it, between the negotiating a lot. Uh, that has actually changed in the last four or five years. Uh, the like-minded developing countries of about 30-something countries includes uh, China, India, uh, Egypt, uh, the Alba group from South America, you know, Venezuela, Argentina, uh, then we have Malaysia, we have Pakistan. We're talking about uh, countries that have something like, how many? Up to something like 60, 70 percent of the world's population uh, feels the most impact in terms of climate change. So, and India, you know, I mean, these are, this is some really amazing, and even small ones like Dominica, which is a tiny island in the, in the Caribbean, you know. So, this, this was, um, uh, in Mali uh, and Sudan, uh, uh, then there was also, I think, uh, Iran, um, yeah. Vietnam. So, so, so this, this uh, light market developing group of countries was still part of G77, but because they got together and they really raised the, the, the level of what would be acceptable or not acceptable. So when you have a whole bunch of countries that come together, then you are, you are stronger. And I think it is that unity and that sort of uh, persistence on principle, 
right? That we now have a Paris Agreement that covers all litigation, adaptation, technology, finance. Because what developed countries wanted out of a Paris Agreement was to focus only on mitigation and to shift the mitigation burden more to developing countries, especially the middle income, bigger developing countries. They were willing to give a little bit of exception to small islands and these developed countries, but the idea was to draw most of the developing countries, including Malaysia, Philippines, others, uh, into, into having the same level of responsibility uh, internationally as the developed countries. And when you agree to something that's unfair, it does. Now, I'm saying when we come home, we always must do more, okay? I'm, I'm separating this a little bit from the international, uh, why international fairness is important, because globally we have to do a lot of things together. If, for everything that developing countries do, if, if the bulk of the developed countries don't do their part, we also won't get there. So, so I, I would not, I, compromises, yes, there were a lot of compromises, but I think we also have what we call red lines that many developing countries had. And one of the biggest red lines was we will not give up the principle of equity, common beneficial responsibility. We will reaffirm that historical responsibility is part of the, of the, of the deal. We will have a, an agreement that will cover all the different aspects of climate action. We have that. And we also have an additional thing that is not in the original convention. Loss and damage. Beyond a certain point, we cannot adapt. It's permanent loss and damage. Okay? Your, your swords are so saline that you can't grow things anymore. Uh, your coral reefs disappear forever. So loss and damage after a lot of fight is now recognized as a separate pillar of action, of climate action. Now, it was a high price to pay because uh, the, the small islands wanted 1.5, somewhere at the number 1.5, and in return for that, they had to accept something that the rest of the, most of the rest of the world did not want to accept, the developing countries, which is that you have a provision in the Paris Agreement that says you will not use uh, the fact that loss and damage is recognized as a pillar of climate uh, concern, you cannot use that as a basis for liability and compensation. Okay? Uh, this is what it says in the decision uh, of, of the of the, the came with the agreement. But of course, uh, we will find that out. You cannot use that, you cannot, let's say, in, in other words, you cannot go to a court and say, because of Paris Agreement Article XXX for loss and damage, I want to sue, let's say, a company or the United States government or something like that, right? But it doesn't mean that loss and damage is not entitled for financial support. So, so, so we want to find out what, what, uh, what is still available. It was a high price to pay because the concept of liability, right? If you're a small uh, country or vulnerable country, it was very, very hardly fought for. And that was given up by a very closed door meeting of the EU, the United States, and some small islands. Nobody else knew about it. And then you just, in the last minute, you sort of say, do you want to drag the whole thing down and collapse it? It's a lot of pressure on, on that kind of stuff, okay? Uh, so, uh, so I would say it's not that uh, there were some compromises, and then some of the compromises were not collective, but in the end, I think on the whole, we got a better deal than we expected. That is not to say we should be saying we are happy with it. We need to do a lot more to make sure that in the implementation, we get back the best. Uh, final question to you. I, I, well, you mentioned earlier about how you know a change of word uh, sh from uh, from yeah. shall to should uh, change the whole meaning, the whole responsibility that countries sh uh, should do uh, for climate change. Um, I wonder um, how. I mean, are developing countries happy with the whole agreement? Do you think it's beneficial for them at the end of the day? I think you have to do your climate change survey to find out. <laughs> that depends on who you ask for. I think there are those who say that we have lost some things compared to the original convention. Yeah, and we have. We have also gained more detail in terms of operationalizing equity, for example. But in the end, you know what? Words are words. Are, I think we have lost like this shell for developed countries. It means that you know now it's all voluntary in a way, you know, for mitigation for everybody. Uh, but I don't think that we want to be bogged down by that. I think in the end, it's the pressure that we're going to put in every country on our politicians and our policy makers. Uh, I think we, 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 we will always use ambiguous, because in the end, when you compromise, you think you are not clear here and there, then you're going to use that ambiguity uh, to try and get the best. But ultimately, I think we have a framework that we can all work with in different ways, and I think we need to really capitalize on that. But I, I want to emphasize, it is not an environmental agreement. It's a sustainable development uh, challenge, right? And very quickly, lastly, and the other thing is, as we are doing our training and educating ourselves, don't look only at the Paris Agreement and all that. Look at the totality. I want to quickly share with you, on Wednesday, this week, all right, 
the World Trade Organization has made a ruling in a panel because um, uh, India, the Indian government was taken uh, by the United States government to a WTO dispute, right? Because the Indian government has this uh, national solar mission. Very important because they went from zero solar uh, energy to really the, one of the most rapidly increasing solar energy countries in the world. But one of the things that the Indian government requires is that if you are supplying solar panels, etc., to Indian uh, generator for power, part of your contract requires what they call domestic content. All right? This is quite common. Malaysia used to do that as well. In other words, you not everything must be imported 100 percent because India also produces solar panels and parts, etc., etc. So it is a national policy to create employment, to create industrial development in your country, transfer technology, and you're not just buying you know, expensive technology all the time. So this is called domestic content. This was challenged all right, as, a, as an un, un, uh, illegal subsidy. All right, so it's gone in the, to, for the last uh, 12 months, there's been uh, 12 hearings in the WTO panel. And on Wednesday, the ruling came out that India is in violation of two, at least two agreements of the WTO. Now, this Solar mission of India, this whole policy, is part of India's submission to the UNFCCC as their national contribution to bring down emissions and to move towards renewable. Right? Now, so these trade rules are anti-climate change, they're anti-sustainable development. Those rules have to be changed, but right now they're more powerful. Right? So, and then we have uh, cases like, uh, like our Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, the TPP, which is very controversial in Malaysia at the moment, all right, there are many, many provisions there that will not allow us to take the kind of action that will need that will be needed for climate transformation. And if you take actions that affect the profits of big companies or even expected potential profit, they haven't made anything yet, they can sue the government for compensation. Quick example, the Obama administration has been sued by a Canadian company because they cancelled their pipeline project right, from, from, from Canada to the US for billions of dollars. This is not a court. This are uh, private arbitrators, a tribunal from lawyers from very, very small mafia, from, the, from, from mostly US, uh, North America, and, and Europe, and I mean mafia. One day they are prosecuting, next day they are final arbitration. No accountability, no review, no appeal. Okay? And most of the cases are in favor of the big company. So we have to fight the TPP as well if you want to make your Paris Agreement. Be real. So addressing climate change is beyond just the COP21. But anyway, we'll let's move on to uh, the next speaker, Eileen C. She is uh, another lady, a very young one. Uh, she's one of the Malaysian Youth uh, Delegate or NYD member who has been chosen uh, to attend the COP21 in Paris and currently a pre-university student. She has shown extraordinary passion to make contribution in uh, addressing uh, climate change and being part of the national climate movement since 18 years old. So she'll be sharing with us more about her perspective. So my first question today, uh, Ms. Elaine, are uh, all these processes achieving anything? I mean, as a young person looking at the whole picture. Uh, so I think overall, um, you can read, if you want to know the facts of the uh, Paris Agreement, you can read a lot of infographic, very uh, simple one on um, web, uh, websites, or you can even read uh, Ms. Nina's um, analysis, I think it's very helpful. Uh, so, um, in the Paris Agreement, um, personally, I think, like what your Green and Nokia have just said, um, the very important thing is um, the equity and the CBDR principle is kept inside. And then um, they recognize the importance of uh, continuous and predictable uh, financial resources for the uh, implementation. And uh, all these things you can read up. Um, so I would like to share more about like um, uh, of the impacts on the public and the youth. So personally, um, I think uh, the COP21 actually raised uh, uh, awareness of the public about like the climate policy because <coughs> a lot of people they doesn't know about the climate policy. I mean, in Malaysia, it's very um, obvious. Like a lot of people they know about climate change, but they doesn't know about what's happening. Like what what the countries are doing uh, together, work or sort of in solidarity to come up with this kind of agreement and um, come to a consensus to do uh, everyone work together. So I think uh, because this COP anyone is. Um, comparatively, a uh, um, larger, like, um, 
how to say it's most people see it as more significant because it's like a milestone. Like um, we have agreed to come out with an um, agreement by um, 2015. So um, the impact is very big and a lot of like youth, I think for COP21, a lot of youth delegation from different, different countries have attended it. So um, on social media and websites, more information is uh, available. So I think uh, that's much more awareness raised about it. You have meme in um, Instagram and um, you know, so Tumblr, all the social uh, media. So it's more information available at that time. So the impact is bigger, so more uh, people can get to know more about it. And another thing is, I personally, personally feel it, it's a very strong impact. Like, um, the COP21 is not only a convention for the countries to come together and to, um, to, to discuss about this climate change agreement, but also a very good a platform for the uh, civil society organization to come together and share share their experience and what they are doing in their own countries together. Because when you share all this among each other, you actually recharge each other because when you go back to your own countries, you actually fight like you, you, you have to do something like uh, your public in your countries doesn't really um, care about it and you, you feel very tired or yeah, then so when you go there, you meet people, uh, like-minded people, and uh, listening to what uh, other people are doing, like great jobs, uh, uh, climate movements, then you feel very pumped up to bring all this back to your own uh, country. So I think this is an achievement for the youth who participated in that. Uh, so you can know people and, and get very encouraging inspiration that you can bring back to your own society. So generally, it's quite optimistic. So I wonder how vocal the Southeast Asian youth were at COP21 and why they were youth activists that say that it was a failure for COP21? Um, uh, uh, I'll address the uh, Southeast Asian youth first. Uh, so from what I see, the Southeast Asian youth is not very active yet in the core processes because um, there's a, a lot of obstacles and barriers for us like uh, funding is the is a very important thing like for us to fly to Paris um, to go to so far and you have to stay there the exchange rate and funding is a very important thing that all a lot of global south countries youth uh, uh, I would say uh, civil society organization is facing so um, without funding it's really hard for you to go to part, even participate in that. So another thing is the badges. Like for us to go to the COP21, we need like badges, a pass to go into the uh, venue. So it's limited. So um, we are very lucky. So for our delegation, we only get our badges in a few days before we reach Paris. So it's it's very uncertain. Things are very, it's, um, those passes are very, uh, uh, I would say limited and scarce. So um, we are very lucky because our uh, minister, uh, our minister of uh, natural resources and uh, environmental, are uh, willing to be more transparent. So this year they um, grant us a few um, national delegates badges, which allow us to go into the some of the coastal negotiation. Uh, so this. All these things are blocking the youth to go, their efforts to go to this kind of um, um, international conference. So, like from Southeast Asia, only a few delegation, I think it's less than five, like in a delegation in a group, who attended the COP. Imagine we have 10 countries, so some countries they don't even have a youth delegation. So, when you say a youth participation is really. Um, is not that active. Mm -hmm. We have some opportunities for the, um, the youth to speak uh, out there when we are in the COP. Like for example, Indonesia, their pavilion have an event for the uh, Southeast Asian youth to present what they are doing and have a sharing session. Um, but, and also like personally I give an intervention, but uh, all this doesn't really make a, a huge impact to voice out, really voice out what we want or what we really are concerned. But uh, one thing that I uh, noticed is that
the interviews are, are better. Like um, we have like bilateral meetings with other youth delegations, like from um, Australia, from um, other countries like Taiwan. So all these kind, we conduct interviews for every country because all of us want to know each other, what's each other doing, what's the condition of uh, every countries. So I think this kind of interview is even better, even even more suitable for us to voice out what we really want and what we really think. So um, currently, like from my experience, I think this is the pathway that we can um, um, get our voice out. So um, in Asia, it's quite um, active, like China and Taiwan for youth. But uh, Southeast Asia is more scattered, like a lot of them go uh, representing their own organization, go by, like individually. So it's like maybe one person representing one organization. So there's no delegation, so the impact is uh, relatively lower. But why it was considered a failure? Is it just the way it's been, uh, the, the, it's not inclusive enough or do you have more comments on the agreement? Um, I will not say the, uh, the, the, COP, the uh, agreement is a failure. I think what um, they are trying to say is like, uh, there's a lot of youth they are voicing out through uh, climate mobilization, right? Like a uh, climate movement. So actually what all this movement is more about is like they are pushing the boundaries out like they are, yeah, they are voicing out what they want like giving pressure like all of what the uh, CSO are doing so in the core venue itself every day you have a lot of actions inside like a lot of people are holding banners um, yeah yes we have like fossil all day then you have an um, organization printing out their daily uh, uh, updates and newsletter giving out pressure to the uh, like lobby to lobby the the negotiators. So I think it's not um, they are not calling the, the agreement a failure, but it's more like to push <coughs> to push to push um, what they want the, the agenda of the, the CSO to uh, for the uh, the negotiators and national delegates you know. So uh, personally, I joined a uh, we call the, the la one of the largest uh, climate movement in Paris. So that time was the uh, D12 Red Line movement. So this movement actually is to um, to raise voice to, to, to defend the Red Line. Um, like what do you call the Red Line? It's like a minimum. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the non-negotiable minimum uh, necessity for us to have a just, a livable planet. So, at uh, that time, uh, one of our members was the main committee to, to organize this huge movement. Uh, we marched from Arc de Triomphe to the Eiffel Tower and we, we, we basically it's a, a mass the obedience. Now. So, yeah, yeah, we, we, we sit in, the, in front of the, we block the road and we have a 100 meter long banner writing, uh, keep it in the ground. That means you want to keep the fossil fuels uh, in the ground. So this is, uh, it's actually very fun because, uh, I, 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 what is this? Like, it's very inspiring. Huh? Like after you join, you feel very pumped up. Like, oh wow, um, everyone from different countries is like, seriously, everyone around you is like from different country, and everyone's having the same, um, same, um, Objective, same cause. Then everyone is working towards the same, uh, what well, the same beliefs are. So, uh, this inspired some of our members to bring this back to Malaysia. So we are hoping to do another one. Um, uh, after our uh, power shift camp, um, at climate education camp, something like this in Malaysia. So you are planning to be more inclusive and by bringing this uh, movement back to Malaysia, it's very, very, very good. Uh, let's uh, open the discussion to the floor. Uh, perhaps we have some young people here? Okay, we have one there. <laughs> Not so young. We have a lot. You can come to the center and stand up and just uh, give a mention of your name and where you are from. Okay. So what was I want to make a question for Mr. Gary. Uh, your, your name and where you're from? My name is Leo. Um, I work in with a website called Messive, and I just launched another one called TPP Debate. So that's my topic, uh, fighting the TPP and the environment. Thank you. 
So I have one question for Mr. Gary and one for Ms. Yogling. Uh, Yogling, sir. Uh, for Yogling, um, you say that there is so much to right, for the 1.5 degrees, that the implications are huge. So my question is, if the Federal Network is going to engage in a kind of call to arms, because I know that you have a lot of information, like inside this information, right, from your attending meetings in Geneva and all this stuff, that has to translate somehow to demonstrations, to pressure, to lobbying, and all that stuff. I don't know if the World Network is engaged in this kind of activities already, or if it's planning to step up the fight, to make it really uh, a fight. And my question for Mr. Gary, oh, yes, I got my comment. So maybe I can make my question after. <laughs> Actually, the, uh, the thermal network is part of a, of a global coalition called Demand Climate Justice. Uh, this was something that was launched uh, about maybe three to four years ago. Uh, and these are really, uh, really big networks. Those who are fighting, uh, and the, the three main sort of uh, banner, you know, sort of uh, issues is energy, water, food. Uh, uh, under which this uh, demand climate justice is. And this is really, the idea was to say, okay, you know, climate climate justice really is not about just what, I mean, we follow the negotiations because we want to know what's happening in that arena. But how do we connect that, you know, what we need to do for climate uh, justice means that it is all the movements fighting for just work, uh, for agriculture, for rights of communities, indigenous peoples, farmers, it's all that struggle for sustainability and human rights. It's all linked to the notion of climate justice. So three, four years ago, there was this uh, this, this uh, launch of this big uh, campaign. Uh, it's not it's less. Well, it's campaign in the sense that there are activities, so you know, groups and countries can do things as well. But it's really sort of trying to keep information going to all the different uh, parts of the of the movement. Now, as the whole network, uh, we we wear kind of different hats. We have a lot of national partners, uh, and we work through a lot of our national partners because sometimes to keep your access for some things, you have to you know not be seen so radical. Uh, but I think our positions are very radical in many respects. Uh, we, uh, you know, so we will, we will be supporting a lot more uh, of the work that we have always done in, in national uh, advocacy. But I, I think I want to stress that, you know, before, and as, as this is why I think the NYD approach uh, is, is very important, the training and the information and the knowledge. Not just information, there's a lot of information out there, but the knowledge and the understanding. And they get so pumped up Right? that you want to do something. Uh, and you know, it's overwhelming, and it's easy to be overwhelmed by the enormity of what needs to be done, uh, and then feel like you're helpless. And I think we, we need to sort of say, you know what, you unpack everything, and there are many things we can do, and then collectively we can be very effective. But let's not be over-optimistic, because the obstacles and the challenges are enormous, because the rich, rich industry, the fossil fuel players, who influence presidential campaigns, uh, prime ministers and members of parliament, they are really powerful, okay? And, and we are very limited in our resources. Our biggest strength is knowledge, transparency. If things are out there in the open, it is very hard to run away from it. Of course, still you can run away from you know, openness, but never mind. We just don't give up. But I think for, for Third World Network, we feel that our contribution is to take those thousands of pages, analyze them, get the information out, work with governments, CSOs, so-called experts, but also keeping our feet with the communities on the